Jesus said, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. We're so glad you chose this place and this time to worship him. We'll now ask if Betsy, Rebecca, and Emily Mills will come forward and for the lighting of the Advent count. <coughs> candle. We invite you to hear the word from the Gospel of Matthew, the first chapter, verses 18 through 25. When his mother Mary had been engaged to, jo to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with the child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to, the, to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means... God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, may the light of this candle illumine our path through life, so that our way is the way of righteousness trust, and faithfulness. Amen. Jesus loves us and gives us the grace to love one another. If we would, please stand and greet one another with signs of peace and fellowship, after which we will sing, Word of God, come down to earth.
say the Apostles' Creed found on page 881 in the hymnal. And as we finish that with song, if the children would make their way down for the children's message. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. This morning, we're, I wanted to talk to us just a little bit about something you've seen a lot, but you may not know what it's really all that much for. I brought this morning a mat. It's a welcome mat. See there, it says welcome on it. All right. Now, a welcome mat has two basic purposes. The first purpose is to wash your feet off, to scrub your feet off before you go in the house. Now let me tell you a little story. My mother, I left my children who were just about your age with my mother one time and she had just moved into a new house on Short Street out back of pack -a pig And they, she, had a, she had gone in the um, entrance hall and she had put a beautiful white rug she hadn't finished landscaping and it had been raining. So the perfect storm was about to happen. <laughs> so a few hours later when I came back, the children were sitting on the back doorsteps. <laughs> and I said, what are y'all doing out here? And they both kind of looked down and they said, well, we made perfect little feet on that carpet going into grandmama's house. <clears throat> and she locked us out of the house. <laughs> Now there's another use of a welcome mat. It's to welcome people. You want to welcome people into your home. You want to be hospitable. We do that as Christians. You have one of these? Well, do you welcome people? We welcome all kinds of people into our home. People that are from around here and people that are from off. Uh, all kinds of people. Short people, tall people. It doesn't matter. We welcome people into our home. We we have, and we want the warmth of our home to be make them feel good, right? And then there's a third thing. We want the exact same thing to happen right here at church. We want to welcome Matt out front so that people understand when they come to Ann Street United Methodist Church, they are really welcome as people have done for centuries. Isn't that neat? There's a final thing we can use it for. We can take the welcome mat just like this and we can stand in front of it. And along about this time of the year when you're thinking about Christmas, we can welcome the baby Jesus into our hearts. So let's think about the four ways we're going to use this little simple welcome mat. First of all, we're going to make sure that we wipe our feet. If not, Grandmama's liable to lock you out of the house. Okay, the second thing is we're going to welcome people into our homes. We're going to welcome people into our church is the third thing. And we're most of all going to welcome Jesus into our heart. 
pretty cool idea for a little old welcome mat, isn't it? Let's pray, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, help us to remember that when we welcome others into our homes and into our church, it is the same as welcoming you. Amen. Thank you for coming down. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, all day, all day. And welcome Jesus into your heart. You think you'll come? <laughs>
Gracious Heavenly Father, all that we have is yours. We return this portion and ask that your Holy Spirit bless it, that we would be one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry around the world. Amen. Hear the word of God from Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. Again, Lord, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol and as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, it is too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be a desert. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. How good it is to gather together and to hear the word of God and to uh, come now to the gospel. Matthew 1, starting at verse 18. Hear the word of God. Now the birth of Jesus took place this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This afternoon, I'm going to be in the children's play, and I'm playing Joseph. And it reminded me of, um, of a conversation I had with a little boy who was about to play uh, Joseph in the Christmas play at his church. This was some years ago at the church. The children were going to do their parts, and some were angels, and some were shepherds, and wise men, and all the rest. But this little boy looked very frustrated because he was playing Joseph. And uh, I said, well, why are you frustrated? What's wrong with playing Joseph? He said, Joseph doesn't have a speaking part. (laughs) I thought about it and said, you know, you're right. He doesn't say anything in the stories. He doesn't say anything. That's the way the Christmas pageants usually portray Joseph. and, And one can understand. Mary gets lots of the attention and, and maybe that makes sense and, and that's fine. She gets her annunciation. You know, that's when, they, when the angel told, Gabriel told her that she'd have the baby. And then out of response to that, she gets to sing a beautiful song. Let it be with me according to your word, she says. And then she has this beautiful piece, my soul magnifies the Lord. Well, you know, when you hear people say the Magnificat, and you're like, what's the Magnificat? That's, that's Latin. That's that first word. My soul magnifies, magnifies. My soul magnifies the Lord. 
Joseph, he gets an annunciation too. But in, I don't know if it's just typical male fashion or something, he doesn't have any more than a grunt. Huh, okay. According to Matthew's gospel, yet, even though he doesn't get a speaking part, Joseph is really important. In fact, our verses today started at verse 18 in the gospel because the first 17 verses of Matthew are genealogy. And, and I like genealogy, okay, but when I see someone and they say, well, I'm going to go start reading the Bible, and I, I think I'll start in the New Testament, and they open to Matthew 1, and they start reading that so-and-so begat so-and-so, and about 15 verses in, 10 verses in, they're starting to lose, starting to lose their attention. But Matthew really was doing that, 17 verses of genealogy to lead up to the point that Joseph is listed last in the genealogy and is then celebrated as the one to whom all of the kings and prophets, all that work, all those, all those begats were directed at Joseph. And so now the spotlight's on Joseph, even if he doesn't get a speaking part. Everything, actually, if you think about it, hinges on him. God didn't pick another descendant of David. God chose Joseph, who was engaged to marry Mary, the one that he, that God gave Jesus and put Jesus in. So now, but at the same time, Joseph gets a decision. Mary didn't get a decision. She was told it was going to happen. Joseph is, is told what to do, but he doesn't actually have to do it. He even had a plan A and a plan B, it looked like. Because before uh, the angel even speaks to Joseph, he's already got a plan A. He was going to dismiss her quietly. Not as bad as dismissing her publicly, which would have been awful, but he was going to dismiss her privately. But when Gabriel speaks to him, and the angel speaks to him, I should say, uh, then all of a sudden he, he goes to plan B. Now everything depends on him. What if, and we just take this for granted, but what if Joseph didn't obey? <coughs> what if he heard this and said, oh, I don't know. There are other times in the Bible when an angel tells someone what they're to do and they don't follow it. So it's not like, it's like he was a robot. He had a choice. What was he going to do? What if he didn't do it? Things might not have worked at all like, out like they did. Here's Joseph. He didn't ask for this. He didn't deserve to have to have all of his life turned upside down. He didn't rehearse this. Nobody told him before this angel came. Nobody really told him what was going to happen or what he heard in this dream. Most men of that time would have broken off the engagement to this woman because by being pregnant before their marriage, she had shamed herself. And now, because he was associated with her, shamed him. And what did people in town think? Uh, they didn't walk around going, oh, Mary's pregnant. Yeah, it was a, an angel of the Lord told her, and she's going to have a son, and, and, and he's going to be the Messiah. No, they said, you know what Mary and Joseph did? That's what they said. So he was already implicated. But in choosing to keep Mary, Joseph makes it so no one can touch her. In giving her his name and his hand in marriage, he restores her honor, and actually, he lowers his own honor, to receive her because she's been dishonored he takes a hit in his reputation we don't always pick up on that but that's what happens some even kind of say and people get pretty interesting interested in this and they say well you know in that way he kind of prefigured in the way he lowered him his status to to be with her stay with her he kind of prefigured how jesus and god and jesus is lowering down to the span of a child a human to be with us. How would he be expected to raise this child now? What would he do? Was Joseph the father or the stepfather? Did he have the ability to, to say anything to Jesus? 
Uh, it, it, is Jesus adopted on his father's side? And, uh, how in the world do you try to discipline Jesus if you're his earthly father? And, and you know that you're kind of a, not a totally a stand-in, but in some ways. If, if Jesus is jumping on the furniture, can you say, get down, or is that blasphemy to tell him to not do that? <laughs> Remarkably, Joseph just does what he's told. He does the hard work. He puts himself in that strange spot of being the sort of quasi-earthly stepfather of Jesus. And he takes his place. He walks by the donkey that carries Mary and the child. He stands over the, uh, over the baby Jesus and your nativity. I know you always get to that point and you're trying to figure out which of those ones that look alike is Joseph and which ones are the shepherds, Right? He stands in his place. When a warning came that Jesus' life was in danger, he took the family even into exile in Egypt. They became refugees, something we've heard about lately. Uh, and he even makes sure that Jesus gets a trade, learns the, the tecton, the, the, the engineering of their time, which was mostly carpentry, and, and makes sure that he's a, at the temple when he's supposed to be. And you know what? Joseph steps in and does his work. He didn't get a uh, speaking part. He didn't get a spotlight. He didn't get a song. But he does his job. You know, I, I see a lot of people, men and women both, all being and living into the calling that God has for them in their lives. I see them in this church, and I see them in the community, and I see them around the world and down through history, and you do too. You know, some people in the faith are called to do a lot of the talking. They're set apart, and that's just the way God is, seems to order things. Uh, some people are called to do a lot of the teaching. Some people are called to be martyrs even, to do dramatic things, to be prophets and to stand up to power. Uh, People are called to all manner of things. But then the vast majority of Christians, it seems, are, are called to be faithful like Joseph in those difficult times and in those unusual places and situations. To do even what they know is right, and, but it's going to cost them something. Uh, to, to still follow what they know, even if they didn't have a, a vision or a dream or an angel to tell them, they're still going to they're still going to do what's right, what God wants them to do. They may not be even carpenters, but they have the, and they may not even be the ones with the certain words, and they may feel like, and you may feel like from time to time that, you know, I just don't know what I'd say, or I don't know how to preach about this or talk about that, and I don't know all enough about the Bible but you live into that holy calling that God has for you in your life. It's fidelity, quiet fidelity, without fancy words or fanfare, just doing what needs to be done, making a sacrifice even. If I were the one that was in charge of assigning who was patron saint of whom, I would assign Joseph to be the patron saint of all those, like so many of you, who were faithful John Milton once wrote, They who also serve the Lord, who only stand and wait. I've seen folks like you play out the role of Joseph in your lives. And I won't get too specific. I know here, and, but it's true here and other places. Situations where you were put in a really bad spot. You encountered a loss. You, you uh, stood up for something that was right at work uh, and, and, and took a, a hit because of that. Or, or you uh, had someone in your family that was um, confusing their role in the family and, and you lovingly dealt with the situation. Or, or you had some kind of um, uh, decision to make uh, in the community, something uh, that was part of your responsibilities and you... You, you stepped into that space. 
So many times when people are driven to a fight or flight response, but they don't choose either of those, they choose a faith response. God called them and calls you to be Joseph and whispers in your ear, be not afraid. Listen, here's what you're going to do. Here's what's going to happen. Are you willing to continue to step into that? Because Christmas is upon us, and with the Christmas pageant that is your life going on, you might not get a speaking part. But will you play the faith part? If you do, we don't have to worry too much about Christmas. Because God's plan will go on. Because you are faithful. And because God is good. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and narrow pining Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope the weary world rejoices For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn Fall on your knees Oh, hear the angel voices For night divine Pastor Taylor, the pastor here at the church, and I help lead and help the uh, grown-ups and adults and the youth all to know about God. And so I'm glad you're here so we can have just a few moments, I won't take long, uh, to just talk to you about what you're up to and why you're here at this Christmas service. Are you here because mom and dad made you come? Yeah. Are you, but are you here because 
And, and are you thinking all you can do just to, just to try not to say, I want to go home so I can get ready for Santa, right? right? It's hard. It's hard, I know. But this is why we really have Christmas. And you know that. Many of you know that. We really have Christmas because it is when Jesus was born. And Jesus, of course, being born was something super, really special. Uh, and it's one of the biggest things that ever happens in his life so, and for us. So we're here to do that. Now, we're going to have a little brief birthday party. Would you like to do that? How about that? We're going to have a birthday party. Did you get an invitation when you came in, some of you? Okay. Okay. And it says it's a celebration for Jesus on what date? December 24th at 5 p.m. The place is Bethlehem. Now, did we go all the way to Bethlehem today? Not, not really like we think, right? But we're talking about something that happened in Bethlehem. And so God helps us to, to be like we're in Bethlehem too, to be like we're there with Jesus. And at this party is being announced by a man named Isaiah. And some of you older kids are going to know that Isaiah was what we call prophet. And, of course, he would tell us that the new Savior was to be born, this Jesus. And we heard him uh, tell us that through Mr. Sam's reading tonight. So as we come now and get ready to have our little party, let's look at a little example of what it was like back then. Now, this is a small example, and I know you can't see it too well. Uh, and it's, but it's old, and it was been here in the nursery at this church for I don't know how long, probably a really long time. So I brought it out because it's kind of special around here. And we have here the baby Jesus in a manger, see? And this is Mary. Yes, Mary, okay? And Joseph, I'll lift it up so you can see a little better. There's Mary and Joseph over here. And, and, baby and baby Jesus and some animals and a shepherd boy over there with a little lamb. Now, why are they in there with animals? Because the animals want to see baby Jesus be born too. The animals want to see it too, that's right. And there was no room for them in the guest houses of the people that lived around there. Sometimes we call it the inn. Uh, but you know, there was no innkeeper in the Bible story. It just says there was no room in the inn. You're going to go back and impress your parents with all little facts, right? But this Christmas, when your mom and dad say, well, then the wise men came and you, and with the shepherds, and you say, no, the wise men came a few years later. So they're in Matthew. They're not in Luke. So you just impress them with your, with your, with your knowledge, right? And here in this scene, we are seeing something that was really hard for them. They look pretty happy, but, you know, it was really hard. What do you think it smelled like back then? It, it, it smelled like it did. It smelled stinky. Everybody, pinch your noses. Oh, it stinks. Oh, oh, the animals—they're so smelly. They're not—they're not using litter boxes and stuff. They're just—they're just doing everything, you know. What do you think it sounded like back then? Yeah. Can everybody make an animal sound that you think was there? Everybody, all at once. Yeah, a dog. What else? Moo. Right. What about a donkey? Eeyaw, right? All kinds of sounds. Let's hear it. Come on, I don't hear enough sounds. This is, this is kind of a quiet barn. Come on over here, girls. Come on. Let's hear some sounds. Wow. Now, could you have a baby with all that going on and it's smelling bad? Wouldn't that be amazing? How did they do that? How did you do that? It just was time for him to come. It was his time. So it's really, really kind of amazing when you think about it. Now, back then, every, even the people that were there that, that night might not have realized how important and special this was. But we know now that this was the time when God was coming as a child, as a baby. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and that's why we say it's a mystery to us. It's a, it's a strange thing that we'll never really understand. But it is so beautiful, and it's how we know God's love through Jesus. Uh, it's something that we can't, we don't have words for all the ways that it, what it means and how it, how it helps us. But what you can do is when you're here tonight, you can think about the Lord Jesus. You can think about how he didn't come on a, on a chariot or a tank or a horseback or, or a chicken. He came, he came, 
He came as a small baby born in a stable in this little humble place. Yeah, I don't know. There weren't any unicorns back then, but that would have been cool, wouldn't it? So that would have been cool. Now, we then get to have a birthday. Now, let's get our birthday party started. How about that? First thing we're going to do before we bring out our cake, though, and we are going to bring out a little cake. You won't be able to, you'll have to wait till after the service to have a little piece if you decide to, okay? But anyway, what we're going to do is have a prayer. Now, it's not just any prayer. When we have a prayer on Christmas, we're kind of like making birthday wishes. Who knows about <laughs> birthday wishes? Do you ever have a, um, you ever make a wish before you blow out your candles? No. No. You ever do that? No. Well, a prayer is different than a wish, but tonight we'll talk about what, it, what would our birthday wishes be for Jesus. What do you think Jesus might wish for on his birthday? Mm-hmm. There, no more evil, right? What else? What do you think Jesus would wish for on his birthday? What, what do you think Jesus would like to see happen? Yes. Love. love. Absolutely. Love, love, love. Any other ideas? Oh, newborn. Mm-hmm. For peace and for health for everybody. What else? Yeah. How about the grown-ups? Do you want to share anything? What do you think Jesus would wish for on his birthday? Oh, that's Peace. Love. Good. Everybody to get along with each other? Yes, what yeah. else? And that the grown-ups don't turn evil in the middle of their life as grown-ups. That's right. That the grown-ups stay good, right? That's right. I mean, how about that, right? What else? What else? Anything else? Good. Well, let's look for those things, and let's today, tonight, make those our birthday prayers along with uh, for Jesus. We're going to get move on now. Ready? It's time for us to have a cake to come in. Are you ready to sing happy birthday? We don't have, Candace, we'll do it. We'll, we'll pull it off here. Uh, just because I don't know where to pitch it for at, so. <laughs> okay, let's ready. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy birthday to you. I'll put it in the middle as much as you can. Now, who's going to, can we get the people, the kids? Okay, will you blow? Okay, everybody from where they're standing and sitting, you can blow. Ready? Wow. Well done. Okay. Now, okay, the cake's going to make its way back to the back now so that we can get ready. Why don't you uh, bow your heads with me and let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Will you repeat after me? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming into our hearts and into our world. Happy birthday. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.
Christ was born for this. He hath opened heaven's door, and we are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Angels from the mountains of glory bring your Merry Christmas to you.